We are the team behind iSwitch. Now before we start, we want to tell you guys a story about our motivation behind iSwitch. It's why we decided to create the iSwitch system. It was my grandpa's 82nd birthday. Um, after the rest of the family went home, my grandpa stuck around just with my family. Uh, we were watching a movie. As we were sitting down in our living room, he was on the couch. Uh, as the movie was starting, he was reaching over to turn off the lamp that was right next to our couch. Um, unfortunately, my grandpa is just in the early stages of developing Parkinson's. Um, so he's developed a severe hand tremor. Uh, so he was unable to really grab onto the pull cord. Um, so I reached over and had to help him out. Um, so we thought about this, we looked at this, and we thought we could develop a product, iSwitch, to help out someone like my grandpa be able to control the electronics in their home. So we looked at all these conditions and thought that they were limited in what they could potentially do around their home. And we looked at the statistics, and we saw that there's 35.2 million Americans who have some sort of difficulty uh, with physical activity. Of those, 250,000 of them are people with spinal cord injuries. At any given time, there's 30,000 people in the United States with ALS, and there's over 17 million people worldwide with cerebral palsy. We saw this as a large opportunity to help them out in making their use of their daily electronics much easier. So we set off with a vision at iSwitch. We aim to create an ecosystem that makes the use of home electronics more accessible to those with physical and mobile impairments. Now I want to give you guys a very brief overview of how the iSwitch system works before we do our demo. So it's a pretty simple system. Now before someone wants to use our product, they're going to pre-configure different home electronics in their house with the iSwitch software. Now as you look around the room, you'll see one here, and you'll see one up there and right there. Now what over on this side is a 3D CAD model of what we think our consumer mock-up is going to look like. So after they've pre-configured their house with these different electronics, they just wear our eye tracker. And once they wear the eye tracker, they can look at any of these and will recognize what electronic it is and turn it off and on. Now you're about to see a demo, but before we start the demo, we want to remind you of something. We understand that the eye tracker James is currently wearing and the iSwitch hardware devices that we have around the room are a little bulky. But we like to think that as technology advances and these hardware switches become more like our consumer mock-up and the eye tracker software gets miniaturized, it'll be much more practical for those with physical and mobile impairments. Now let's head over to James with a demo of how this works. For our demo, again, we have three devices around the room. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but trying to control where you're looking at makes me a little nervous. So uh, it's, it's getting a little hot in here. I think I'll uh, turn on the fan. Ooh. So what just happened is the front-facing camera here detected my pupil, mapped that to the uh, fr other front-facing the world camera, and uh, detected whether or not my pupil was uh, looking at the marker. When those two things line up, it toggles the switch. So I know we're not taking notes, but we can make it a little bright in here. And I'm sure that that's making everyone very happy. <laughs> Now, didn't you see how easy it was to use the iSwitch system? We simply pre-configured these three <laughs> devices with our iSwitch hardware, and then all James had to do was look at it and turn it off and on. Now, we really feel here that iSwitch that we can help all 35.2 million Americans that had physical and mobile impairments with their daily lives by using iSwitch. Thank you. Our idea was to create a collaborative augmented reality application. We realized that there are a lot of augmented reality apps out there, but we found none that provided a collaborative experience. What we came up with was a way to collaborate on physical documents using readily available smartphones and a $20 headset known as Google Cardboard. This is the idea behind Collaborate. So meet John. John is an architect for a firm located in Southern California. It is often thought that architects simply design buildings, but most of John's time is spent in collaboration with other firms, contractors, and engineers. John's latest job is a design for a house being built right here in Seattle. This is Frank. Frank is the contractor for that Seattle, same Seattle job. He works closely with the architect in order to take things from design to development. So what's the problem? Frank needs to communicate to John that part of the design viola violates a local Seattle building code. Frank would also like to propose his own changes to solve the problem. So currently, Frank and John could use traditional email communication, but this could take d days or even weeks to solve the problem. Additionally, they can solve this problem over the phone, but this is not ideal as we're trying to solve a visual problem using voice communication. Skype or video conferencing faces the same issues. Our solution is Collaborate. 
a way to collaborate on physical documents through the power of augmented reality. With our application, John and Frank can quickly collaborate on their copies of their own separate blueprints to solve the problem at hand. How are we going to help John and Frank? After connecting through our app, John and Frank are looking at their own copies of blueprints from two completely different locations. As Frank begins writing on his copy of the blueprints, those changes are immediately seen by John on his set of blueprints. And vice versa, when John writes on his set of blueprints, those changes are seen by Frank. So this is kind of a simple example of the collaboration on a, on a set of blueprints. First thing that we do is we actually separate the user's hand from the rest of the scene. Um, we find that oftentimes the hand is ac actually obsc obscuring um, areas that we're interested in. Uh, the second step is actually detecting the piece of paper and um, exam examining that for any pen, pen ink that may, may be occurring on the writing surface. Um, we then take any of these pen markings off the writing surface, send them over the network, and render them into the other participant's view, um, giving the illusion that this writing actually appears on their copy of the document. Uh, all the rendering, plus the rest of the entire application, is built on top of Google Cardboard. Um, this is really cool because it's a really low barrier of entry. Um, there are a whole ton of smartphones in existence, and anybody with a smartphone, all they need are a few dollars, and they can purchase or even build their own viewer. First thing you'll notice is you'll get a little introduction that will help orient new users. So we've built a platform that lets users collaborate on physical documents through AR. We do this because the changes to one document will appear on the other user's document and vice versa. So it's just three steps to get started. One, get your drawing surface ready to go. Two, select the person you want to connect with. And three, just slide your phone into the cardboard viewer once you're all connected up. So here's a connection screen. That's your avatar in the lower right, your friends in the upper left. You tap to connect, and you're ready to go. So now we're seeing a sample interaction between the architect and contractor, in which the contractor is asking for the go-ahead to move one of the walls. The architect wants to know, where do you want to move the wall to? contractor says east. Now the architect wants to know, well, how much? How far do you want to move the wall? The contractor says four inches. Architect thinks about it for a minute. He's like, yeah, that sounds okay. I'll give the go ahead. Our team was spending the last 10 weeks developing an application called Traceroute, um, and the primary use of Traceroute is for interior navigation. Um, so the basic idea is that most, as you all know, most navigational applications right now rely heavily on the GPS sensor of your phone. But what happens when you don't have access to that? You're way off in the woods somewhere, or you're underground like right here. GPS isn't going to work very well. Um, so we wanted some, like an application that would still be able to get you a sense of like relative positioning. Um, without using that uh, GPS. And so, I mean, the benefits, that's going to save you some power, which is pretty cool. And also, phones have tons of really cool sensors to play with, gyroscopes, accelerometers, compasses, all these things that you might not be aware of. Um, what's also cool about this field is that it's being actively researched right now. This idea, it's called pedestrian dead reckoning. Um, locating yourself with that GPS is, there's lots of research papers that are very recent that are coming out uh, using smartphones. And, as you guys all know, like you guys have used Google, Google Maps a lot, so there's lots of p very like obvious use cases for this. Um, so that's pretty much like the motivation behind it, and we learned a ton while developing this. So as Andrew mentioned, there's a whole bunch of sensors on the phone, and so this is one of the screens that you'll. Uh, it's a debug screen actually, so you won't see it, but it's we had to did a lot of research and finding out the sensors that were required to get. Uh, an accurate positioning of yourself. And we found out a lot of these sensors are actually not very accurate, which is unfortunate. But things like the accelerometer bound, uh, is very noisy. The gyroscope drifts off. The compass needs to be on a flat surface to use. Uh, the barometer will detect a couple feet while you're not moving. 
And the step detector can be late to register steps. So when we, uh, for navigation, we need three things, uh, distance, direction, and altitude. So for distance, we settled on using the uh, height and gender of the user to get their stride length that we will use for distance. One of the quick problems with that is if you go upstairs or something like that, we detect that movement going forward instead of diagonally. Direction was probably one of the most tough, one of the toughest things. And so the compass would give us a good understanding, but you have to keep, it puts a strict use condition on the user and you have to hold it flat. Altitude is probably something that we had the most success with actually, because the barometer will, uh, is reasonably accurate and it will level out over time. So as you start going up, it might differ within a couple feet, but that reading will be accurate as you move on. And so how we actually got things to work. So there's this notion of sensor fusion, where you uh, combine multiple sensors to get an accurate reading of what you want. And so we did this very most successfully with drift detection. We were able to detect drift and correct for it. And we would be extending this to use it for uh, direction detection. So if we could uh, simple, uh, get rid of the noise on the accelerometer, because the accelerometer would be very helpful if it wasn't so awful. <laughs> So low pass filters will also, again, make your data less noisy, but we did not have the most success with it. Um, so a large portion of this application relies on using 3D graphics. That was another major focal point of this. Um, and I have had no graphics experience whatsoever, so I was sort of diving into this and I had no idea what I was doing. And so immediately what I realized is that OpenGL um, is what you use, and there is a lot of math that's involved. We had to build stuff from the ground up. And to make matters worse, the uh, API that you use for Android is called OpenGL ES, and it is horrendous for Android. Like, OpenGL is already a little bit clumsy, but then you port it over to Java, and then it just makes everything way worse. Um, so, like, it was definitely pre pretty painful, but it was pretty rewarding. Um, so, th as a result, things that were supposed to be intuitive, you'll see in a second with our demo, uh, we have some camera panning and zooming around the world. Um, but those are usually, you know, intuitive from a user's perspective. You pinch to zoom, you know, you, you do single finger panning just like Google Maps. Well, that requires a lot of math and we didn't get those features fully working. Um, so here's a sort of like static, um, a few pictures of what our application is. You can see we've got like a primary screen um, that shows off some of the 3D applications. This is actually a path that we've been drawing. You can see that this is actually, this sample is from going up and down an elevator. So we walked over to the elevator, we went down. You can see a little bit of error right here and as we go back up uh, the elevator. Um, and we've got a few other things that we'll uh, show you in the video this here. This is a first run where the user will go through the first time they run the application. Yeah, so the first thing obviously we need to detect the height um, and gender so we can compute the stride length. Um, once you do that, you hit continue. Um, you get like a small demo of like what you're supposed to do. This is how you start recording your path that shows you the compass. This is just, to sh this is using the gyroscope to rotate this 3D model um, just to show off the 3D capabilities of our app. So if you hit the play button, um, this is now like you start recording your path at your current position. So as you can see, even right off the bat because of the inaccurate sensors, you get just strange readings. We're supposed to be walking straight and then walking back into the same location. But as you can see, the phone is just, it's not having a good time with this path. Um, if you we, want to say we something. We do have success. I want to point out that we do have success with it, success with actually drawing correct paths. But the amount of, uh, it's not accurate enough to actually be using every day, for example. Yeah. And so here's the pan again. There's a the point. So Pinch to zoom. Uh, there's some panning. Um, you can also rotate it around the origin currently. Um, to get sort of like an idea. You can see still there's some noisy readings because of the so cell phone sensors. This, you can see the, the point of this is to see the uh, elevation gain. And so that was a bad barometer reading, but at the end you saw it and detected a foot of change, which is reasonable. So is that the end of the video? Yeah, okay. So where to go from here? And so we've made a lot of progress in 10 weeks and we found out a lot, but we found out that uh, sensors will not be accurate enough to rely on. And so we need some sort of uh, Bluetooth detection, some sort of access points that has information about the building you're in, or some extra hardware on the user that will help us with uh, detecting where you're going. And there's, again, since this is an active field of research, there's a lot you can, uh, a lot more filters out there that we could have tested with, but due to the time constraints, this is what we got, and we're very satisfied with it. The field's wide open. We just sit yeah. and scratch the surface. And we can talk for hours on this, so if you have any questions, <laughs> <Yeah>. please. <laughs> And we are. I
identify. So think about a professor. The professor has, <laughs> professor has uh, many different students, many students in his class. And he would like to get to know his students a little bit better. But the professor has a problem. The professor can't remember all these students' names. So it's, it's hard to get to know the students better when you can't remember their names. Our vision is to create a world where these kinds of barriers don't exist, where people can get to know each other easier without, without having to you know, get flubbed up because they can't remember a simple name. As you can see, Evan is wearing a pupil eye tracker. Um, so what that does is uh, it uses an out-facing camera and a camera facing the pupil and can detect um, exactly where you're looking. Um, so all Evan does, has to do, is look at someone in the class and then it will capture their face and then it will compare that face to other students' faces in the preloaded data set to tell them um, what the name of the student is. So here is our example of our application here on the for the professor to interface with our application. Uh, so as Daniel said, our, my gaze will be detected. I will see the captured face on the left and the matches for that person on the right. And right now, I'm going to uh, select the class that for us, uh, CSE 481, which is some data of our class. And I'm going to attempt to identify um, someone in the front row here. So because maybe that person asked a question, so I'm going to look at that person's face, uh, see if it detects any faces there in the scene. Uh, waiting a couple of seconds here. Oh, there you can see some, some nearby faces. Uh, so you can see with such a large data set, the, the results are not always the most accurate. Uh, there was a little bit. To compensate for the slight inaccuracies, this is why we're displaying multiple results. First of all, the three nearest faces to my gaze point in the scene, and also the top three matches for that person. Uh, so that wasn't the best demo. However, we do have another demo for you, which is uh, a smaller data set, which hopefully does a little bit better. If we instead limit it just to our project partners and a couple of other people, we have some photos of them to tr uh, test our model against. I'm going to look at my two partners and look at them and see how well the uh, camera is able to detect them in the scene. So we do have Brian and Daniel there. I w Brian was the face I was primarily looking at, and he was the first identified person in the room. So now I can look at that name and say, Brian, what is your question? And they, he will be very surprised at uh, me being able to identify him in that way. Um, anything else? No, that's all right. That's application. Okay, so we evaluated our application on, the, on a number of different levels. Um, the demo you saw with the whole class, um, that was with my UW images from a long time ago, so you've all changed within four years, so it's probably a reason for all that error. Um, but we tested it on a number of different uh, training sets, so we tested it with one face in the training set and three faces in the training set and with a number of different people in the class. And we also used three different approaches to classify these faces. We used Face++, which is a deep learning neural networks algorithm. OpenBR uses eigenfaces, and OpenCV also has a number of older algorithms that we tried out. And as you can see, Face++ does the best. With 25 identities in the class and only one face in the training set, it gets around 45% accuracy. But that's only for the top match. If you consider the top three matches, which is what our application offers, it gets around closer to maybe 55%. That's only with one face in the training set. With three faces in the training set, it does a lot better. So again, with three faces in the training set and 25 identities in the class, it does around 70% accuracy for the top one match. And then for the top three matches, it get, gets around 80% accuracy um, for 25 identities. Um, another interesting data point is that we tried it on a larger data set of 61 identities with a number of different training images. And Face++ got around a 30% accuracy for the top one. So not too bad. We also evaluated some of the other components of our application. The pupil tracker does pretty well when it's at close range like this, but in a larger lecture hall where it might be even more useful, it would uh, decrease, the accuracy decreases with distance. So the seminar is a little better for it in terms of an application use case. Um, uh, once we extract the point of where the gaze is located, we actually do a reasonably good job of extracting the faces surrounding that. And you just saw the accuracies for the facial recognition. Um, one thing that Evan didn't mention is that we also have the ability to update the data set according to if we get um, predictions correct. So that updates the model and makes it more accurate over time. Finally, there are some usability concerns. Um, as you saw with an earlier group, uh, the pupil tracker requires careful calibration before usage, which might limit adoption by professors who might be a little strapped for time. 
And also, people aren't very trusting of wearable cameras right now, so we're, wait <laughs> we're waiting for that social stigma to pass before this sees widespread adoption. Now, although this is a limited use case for the classroom setting only, we can see a lot of potential for the future. With integration with social media, we can see people using this on a wider variety of use cases, such as in everyday life, maybe some sporting events. And also, if tourists are going to a new city and they want to have a little more interactive experience, they can take a look and instead of having to manually look up something on their phone or say, Google Glass, tell me about this, the pupil tracker will see what they're looking and then feed them information on a uh, more continuous basis. So although this is a limited use case for the classroom, we see a lot of potential for the future. Thank you. We are PhoneBrush. Uh, our idea was to have our uh, phone act as a uh, drawing tool, and the thing that we thought would be cool is to use the gyroscope and uh, to show off, um, to use to draw things and... Um, yeah, so basically we wanted to use a motion tracking software to try to do some drawing, and I think the best way to show it off right now is just to start off with a demo. Um, Eric's going to set this up real fast, and I'll try to explain what he's doing in the project as a whole. So the basic setup of the project is Eric's using a, the gyroscope on his phone, and we have this server running right here that uh, is constantly receiving information about the orientation of the gyroscope and where the phone is pointing, and it will convert the data that from the phone to a position on the screen, and you can do, get some pretty cool drawing. Um, and in order to get that to accurately work, what we have to do is beforehand, Eric has to do this configuration process where he has to tell the phone and the computer where they are relative to each other, what direction is on the screen, and how big the screen is. So as you can see now, he's got it connected. And you can see he should be able to draw a square pretty effectively here. Um, as the previous groups talked about, gyroscope data is not very good. Um, when we first started doing this, we saw some pretty atrocious data coming out of it, and it was just you couldn't draw anything effectively. And we kind of started to focus on finding a way to stabilize that and you know, dealing with drift and a number of other effects that have severely affect the user experience. Um, what we were able to do is we found some research from a lab in New Zealand that was actually working on an augmented reality application that had to deal with the similar problems with us. So as you can see, it's, it is pretty accurate. It, we, when we had some earlier testing, you tried to draw a square like this, and it would come out absolutely ridiculous. It looked you know, just scattered. And eventually, you would just drift right off the screen, and you'd never be able to draw something again. So I think that what we have here is actually pretty cool. And we did spend a lot of time trying to figure out a good algorithm to stabilize gyroscope readings. And I think that that's like a main portion of our application. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add, Eric? Uh, so you can note, uh, as you can notice, I'm not really moving as much. Uh, it's because I'm shaking because I'm nervous. But uh, uh, yeah, so it's pretty stable. And before that, it would just, if, you, if you're not even moving it, it just drift left, and then it just disappear. But right now, it's pretty stable. So yeah. Uh, do you want to try to do it over there? Someone else can draw something. <laughs> can we? That's a good question. Smiley face. Smiley face. Do you want to let someone else try to draw with it? Okay. We can reset it up. So we have to go through this quick configuration process. Does anyone, uh, anyone preferably in the middle of the classroom, want to try to draw something? I mean, even if the drawing portion of it doesn't work Perfectly, I think, I think that a really cool part of this project is the uh, stabilizing gyroscope readings because I know that a lot of people, as you could see earlier, the, another group had similar issues. And I think that uh, having a stabilized gyroscope could enhance a lot of applications right now and developers could really use a tool like this. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> All right. So what we did do is we thought of some uh, future applications that, you, that could use a more enhanced gyroscope. And uh, we have some quick videos that we mocked up if pretending as if we had made an application that did some of these more, more complicated things. And Eric will talk about that right now.
Okay, so the first idea was phone gestures. So imagine getting a text from someone and then you just move your phone and it unlock by some special gesture that you made. Another one was presentation pointer where you just use it as a controller for your mouse and instead of having to have a laser pointer, you can just use that and you can click links and everything instead of having a laser pointer. And um, the next one is gaming controllers. So like a Wii controller, uh, you can get, you can play games similar to a Wii and instead of having to buy uh, the hardware, all the hardware necessary, you just use your phone instead and yeah, that's some of the ideas that we, but yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so that's pretty much what we have. We have some links to our source code and a link to the, some of the research that we used to get the, uh, they had some initial implementations for stabilizing gyroscopes and we used some of their ideas. Um, we encourage people to take a look and I think that the biggest takeaway from this project is that you have a new technology that you could use and I know that gyroscopes generally are pretty bad and if you were able to find some way to enhance that, that would be a great thing. There are many logs we have to manage and there are many keys we have to manage, so basically this is something like a smart log to manage all these things. And uh, there's actually uh, already a lot of smart logs in the market and basically they focus on something like uh, using password to unlock or you can tap your phone or something to unlock the door or sometimes they can uh, you can use uh, the smart lock to do something like remote un remote unlock and it seems like they just focus focus on one uh, one functionality but not all so basically what you try to do is like in integrate all kind of these functionalities into uh, one of these small box and we also try to add some more innovative features like uh, using uh, QR code to do like temporary unlocking and try to do a tap and unlock using Bluetooth signal and we're also trying to do a doorbell ringing using the uh, using Apple notifi Apple notification service and this is also pretty cheap it's actually less than $100 yeah. here's, a, here's the difference between our project and the some existing brands See, they are very expensive, two hundred fifty dollars, and the function is very limited. So, yeah, yeah. And this is a composition of, of our system. So basically, our log is uh, consists of a uh, Raspberry Pi over there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's running the TCP server inside, and there's also a uh, two point eight. Uh, 2.8 inch TCP screen and also uh, a webcam over there for doing the QR code, QR code in, uh, decoding and also like doing monitoring things. And there's also the electromagnetic uh, lock for unlocking the door, yeah. And also some other electronic components. And for the other side of this thing, we have also built a an app for managing the lock. Yeah, so then, yeah. And we also make sure that uh, the communication between the lock and the iOS app is safe uh, by using RSA 256 encryption. And we also use uh, some hybrid encryption for, for video streaming. And for the iOS app, uh, there's also an, an optional fingerprint verif verification to make sure that, like, mm, to make sure it's safe to for you to unlock the the door using your iOS app. Okay. So next is some um, video and live demos about functions. So first is you can let let's first show the see the video. Okay, you can just enter the password to. Just simply unlock the door. Yeah, you, you can see the green LED indicates that the door is locked. <laughs> yeah. So, so when your phone has run out of battery, so you can use this alternative way to unlock door without your phone. And so the second situation. Okay. So. <laughs> 
Okay, so you you knock the door and no one answers, and then you can ring the door, and then I got notification that someone's ringing my door, and I can check who's there. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's uh, yeah, and I can verify. Yeah, and uh, unlock the door, and he just comes comes. In. So yeah. so do the live 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 demo. Here's the situation. So you get the uh, invitation from your friend to go to some party or some public event, and you can just scan, scan QR code, and can unlock the door. Yeah. So you can see the green LED to indicate that door is unlocked. Yeah. And next one is very interesting that you can use cell phone just like. Uh, RFID card. You just move. You just tap the tap the log and you get the log. So we built an enhanced e-reader. And so the basic premise of uh, our technology is we wanted to be able to create an e-reader that tracks the user's eye to see where they're reading. Uh, and the motivations for this is from a school standpoint, teachers could track students' reading participation um, over time. You could also gather diagnostic information about students' eyes, particularly students with learning disabilities. Um, and you could be able to figure out kind of how their eyes are moving when they're reading. And also just enhance the overall experience of using an e-reader by adding features such as like auto-scrolling and remember where you were last looking and things like that. Um, and so, just real quick, one of the big challenges we wanted to address was not using any auxiliary hardware beyond the tablet that you already have as your e-reader. Um, but to kind of talk a little bit more about our motivations, I don't know about you guys, I definitely had reading logs like this growing up in elementary through high school, where you write what book you read, how many pages you read, hours, have your parents sign it, and you did or didn't read the hours, you know, so those <laughs> kind of situations. Um, and so as technology is becoming more uh, prevalent with students, uh, we built this application that uh, when students would be reading on their tablets, you could actually track how much of that time they were really reading, how many pages, how often they looked away, how focused they were. So the next one. Additionally, we'd want to be able to uh, aid teachers in teaching kids to read who have learning disabilities. So right now, one of the tools that's used for students who have trouble focusing on text is what you see on the left, and it's just a plastic sheet with a slit that only shows um, one line at a time. And it would be really good if we could get diagnostic information about how students' eyes are actually moving when they're reading and see if we can track any progress over time so you can get a pattern like that to a kind of a steady across the screen pattern. And finally, we just want to enhance the overall user experience <laughs> of being able to read in, on a tablet, regardless of the setting, um, by having things like auto scroll and kind of keeping track of where you're looking to enhance the look and feel. Um, so now we're going to give a live demo of our technology. Uh, we couldn't stream the Android application to the screen fast enough, so we're going to demo the eye tracking capabilities using the PC, and then we have a video of our Android application. So here's Sanjay to show it off. Okay. So this is the prototype that we had for the um, on the laptop um, for porting it over to the Android. So as you can see, it's it's tracking my eye using the webcam, no external hardware. We zoom in to a close-up of my eye after some basic image processing. Uh, if you can see my cursor. I'm going to give it some data about where I'm looking at on the screen currently. And after I do that, I'm going to tell it to train on it. You can see it on the left. And now the giant blue dot is a rough estimate that it has of where I'm looking on the screen. So you can see it's a little inaccurate, but I gave it a very quick uh, amount of training data. Um, but it's still fairly accurate, as in it gives a general estimate of where I am on the screen. So if we go over to a video we have of the actual app, um, from a first-time user's perspective, you would create a profile, and then you'd go through a calibration phase, which is similar to what I did with the cursor on the computer screen. So we set up the calibration dot. It will travel its way across the screen. And I'll be following it with my eyes. So as you can see, it just travels across the screen, and I'll be looking at it. Um, the calibration phase does take a while because we need to capture data across the entire screen. So we're just going to speed it up a little bit. It's going to take a while. So <laughs> uh, Once we capture all of this data, uh, we don't do the processing on the device itself because that would be highly CPU intensive, take way too long. 
Um, so we send the data off to a server where it trains the data, uh, produces a neural net, sends that back to the device, and then it starts using it for the actual e-reader. Uh, and so this is what the actual e-reader looks like. We've overlaid in the background a picture of the face. And the dots represent where you're looking. So the blue dot is kind of the average point of focus and kind of shows which vertical section of the screen Sanjay's looking at. And obviously, in the real application, you turn it off. Um, and it now just looks like a normal e-reader. But it's scrolling automatically based off where he's looking on the screen. And in the background, we're also gathering a lot of diagnostic information about how his eye is moving, how focused he is on, on the text, whether if he looks away to text. You know, we want that information that though he had this app open, he actually was only reading for a certain portion of it. And so we're keeping track of this. Um, and the processing for this is all done on the device because once we have the neural net, it's very quick and inexpensive. Um, but anyway, the data that we've gathered, a student would want to log that so their teacher can see. And at the bot top there, there's a button to log the data and send that to the teacher. And we built um, a web dashboard uh, for teachers to use so that they can monitor the progress of their students. And Andy's going to show that. All right, cool. So uh, what you're looking at here is the uh, web dashboard. Um, this uh, is where all of the aggregate information from our Android application is uploaded to. Um, when you first go to the dashboard, this is kind of the page that I'd see. So I'm a teacher. I'm logging in. I want to see how my students are doing. So you know, I open up the dashboard, log in, and I'm presented with this page here. Uh, first thing you'll see is that I've got this graph right here. Uh, so this is the focus rate. Um, we're kind of collecting this information as the Android app's running. This kind of shows for your whole class how well are your students focusing. You can kind of see how they're doing relative to each other. And on the same page down here, we've got a kind of a bar chart of total time reading. So this is how much time students uh, spend in the app actually reading. And so that's kind of a little convenience there for teachers. Um, the next thing we'll show is the student profile. So uh, first thing I did was looked at the class. Now I can kind of identify which students need help. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to say, OK, I want to find a student. So I'm going to enter their username and pull up their data. So what you see here is that I've got three graphs on this uh, dashboard as well. Uh, there's the focus rate again. And this basically represents, uh, it's a ratio of time in the app spent versus time they've actually read. So it's kind of sh indicating how much they're focused. Um, we've got the time reading. So this is a more detailed version of that bar chart you saw on the first page. It just kind of shows the teacher uh, when and how much students were reading. And then lastly here, we've got the darting rate. And so this is kind of a coefficient that we've calculated. This shows how much their eyes are jumping around the page versus staying in kind of the same area. And you can see here we've got a plot of that with respect to time as well. Thank you, guys. Cool. So our group is the Instantly. Actually, what we're doing is um, develop the software which can integrate all the resources you can around you and, uh, and to serve you. So, for example, um, okay. For example, so um, I need a lunch, but I don't have a car, and I have the probably ten minutes I gotta go to a class. I need to call someone to deliver a lunch for me, but I don't know who can. So I post a task online. So hopefully, immediately someone can pick up, and then someone pick it and deliver the lunch for me, and we uh, complete the transaction, and then rate each other. So that's the one scenario. And the of day, I go to the Home Depot. I find I want to I basically build a house, uh, converting the garage to a bedroom and a bathroom by myself. So I go to the Home Depot, trying to buy something. I find there is a lot of the people waiting outside of gate entrance, and they do you need help? And uh, we can help you to build a house or their handyman's. So I'm thinking about that. So they really need some software, and they can hire by someone to do some private job or kind of thing. And the other things I saw is uh, uh, motivation is uh, the another one of the students uh, from a community college. And there's like uh, only one week from the final exams. They really need someone to help them to practice more and prepare for the final exams. Uh, but it's hard to find a quick person. They probably want to go to a CSC department, you know, <laughs> search someone. And is there any, do you have any available time to uh, 
to help me out that way. So our software is, uh, is trying to solve those questions. But sometimes, uh, for example, you also can post something on the Craigslist or some, some sort of another website. But this advantage is that first, they, uh, they cannot track in your location. The second, they cannot give you the instantly, uh, instant help because probably you're waiting for a week, two weeks, three weeks, still no one to reply. And sometimes no one to email you and you don't want to put your phone there. You know, There's a lot of problems, so we provide that. And the another thing is you don't know those people gonna, who are gonna help you, what kind of the ability they have. They, they say, I am able to do that, but you don't know they're able to do that or not. So we have the quit assistant because you're going to rating uh, each other every time so you can see this people's credit, this people's ability, uh, be able to do such a task. So um, <coughs> here is our <coughs> some very quick video. All right. So CJ need a lunch, but he find there's nothing to eat and he's kind of hungry, right? And <laughs> what can I do? And pick up the app and I'm typing what I need and immediately someone to deliver a lunch. And they confirm it uh, by using the app and rating each other. Done. That's easy. And the second scenario is the furniture. Uh, I think a lot of people have this problem at home. Uh, their furniture break down, but they don't have the right to, or they don't want to repair them. They don't know how to do that. If you have this app, you can just <laughs> post it online, and people around you can bring the tool and help you to fix the furniture. <laughs> So you, you don't need to buy the tools to repair the furniture. Um, as as a computer science student, uh, I know there are many my friends. They have encountered the easy computer problem, and uh, they always ask me, "Can you fix it for me?" Sometimes I have time to do so. Sometimes I don't. So I think. Uh, there are so many people around campus. There are so many people know computers. There are so many people encounter the computer issues. With this app, uh, you can find the people near you when you encounter some problem, and they are able to help you fix those easy problem. We also did the hallway usage testing. It works really well, especially in campus, because there are so many people here, so many people have knowledge about computer and there are so many people encounter the, the small computer issue each day. All right, so now we're going to demonstrate uh, our app. So here is our app. So just go to instantly. Great. So here is our at the University of Washington, and you can zoom out. <coughs> and the scenario is you can simply click the stars, and you can add task, right? And you can change the category. Oops, you can change the category by just web that. There is a lot of category. And you can create a boundary, right? And write description. And also, you can go back to a map, and uh, you can go to the uh, go to a list. Uh, some, some, someone just preferred the list of view, and we provide a list view. Someone preferred the map view, can find someone really near you. And uh, once you you find that, and you say, oh, it's buy me a coffee, and category is another, so bounty is $2, and uh, you know, just post uh, some information there, and you can pick it. 
And uh, after that, okay, you pick the task successfully. So the task uh, immediately disappear on the map because you already pick it. So and I doing a task, and when I come back, so I can see my pick history. All right, so uh, I want to say I completed. All right, now it's from incomplete to not confirmed. From the, if we use, uh, because we only get one Android phone, if I got another one, I can from the use uh, the poster side to complete and confirm and rate it. That's basically what we are doing. Thank you, do you have any question? Show you guys the motivation video first, but before that, I just wanna tell you that our app, um, it's, better be used in a lecture or a conference setting, and it's meant to help um, the lecturer or the speaker to better, to better get a sense of um, the questions being asked and help the audiences to ask the questions why they, when they think about it instead of having to wait. The following are a few scenarios. What might happen? The speaker might not notice Let's go on to a live demo. So these are the hardware we are borrowing from the sensor systems lab, uh, thanks to Valentin Bryce who built the <coughs> hardware. And on top of that, we did some changes to and added to the software part and made our own software to to make it work. And this is the battery-free, battery-enabled microphone. I have a question. So these two things are not the easiest thing to work with. Um, a slight change in the angle of how you're pointing towards it um, has a great effect on the audio quality. So when the audio gets trans transmitted through the antennas back in the computer, we use some, our, our software will be able to de decipher it and figure out who is speaking um, in the audio and convert the audio to text. Take a quite slow and it's trying to do it. So it gets part of my, my question is that I have a question, it's because of, of the I part. And on the bottom it says it's unknown currently because the two, the two speaker that identified, the primary one is me and this also another, so, someone else we use their data for. It's saying that we're too closely aligned together that it's unable to distinguish whether it's really me or is it the other person. So. Um, we could set a threshold for that. Currently, the threshold is set to I think it's point point oh two, because with the with the backscatter microphone, the audio is, quality is not that great, and it's really hard to distinguish who it is, and also because our voice is quite similar. So, so that's. Uh, is there anyone want to try? It? Give it a try. Anyone from the front row or? Yeah. Oh. So I think this one's the receiving end. So you just, just, you just, so you just hold it like this, like the effective. Um, and then just speak into there? Yeah, just speak into there, point into this. You can get a little lower because it's All right. not the best. Ready? <laughs> Can I ever? OK. I have a question. Oh, dude. Yeah. So when it came up. Wait, wait. Okay. Let me know when I'm good. 
I have a question. It's not the easiest thing to use currently. But as the technology gets better and the mic on the on this thing gets better, the antenna is more efficient. Well, we'll say it'll be pretty uh, <laughs> this time, but um, I'm not sure why. They, they said if I set the, set the dialization to false, it'll, it'll speed up the process, which I did. It's still taking around the same time. So that we need to figure out. So, but uh, that's great. the question I have is, uh, is this the older version of the hardware? Because I think the latest version which they have is like less directional and can operate at much larger distances. Uh, that's what Valencia and Bryce gave us. Yeah. Um, this is I, like not finished. They just, they just like I think they're using the other one. Yeah, on my game control. So we just develop, develop our own on my game control to like, uh, uh, process analog and yeah. to like get the, this thing work. I think there you can do it again. Like, yeah, and when we asked them, they yeah, he said that um, with the current setting of the software and the hardware, the noise level is bound to be pretty high. So yeah. this is like the best we could do for the audio part. So the most important important thing now is things we cannot like do it anywhere. Like, uh, so we need to figure out which is the best position to use a uh, better free microphone. So things where uh, this is a backscatter will have like lots of signals in the, this classroom. So uh, I think this is a problem why uh, we need to like figure out the best position. So yeah, last time when we tried it, like apparently on the bottom left of the receiving plate, it has the best receiving. Potential for do some it, reason. Do it again, do it again. I think you'll work. Where is the closest Starbucks? <laughs> oh, for the uh, speaker database, uh, the rec uh, speaker recognition, uh, before the accuracy is pretty low, but after we uh, look at the source code and we modify a little bit, uh, now it works uh, pretty good. Uh, now uh, we only have like two. Uh, okay, it worked. So we only uh, we have only two speaker, and uh, they are also very similar, but I can uh, still de uh, detect which one uh, is speaking. So yeah, the accuracy is not all that high because right now it says I'm uh, someone else. <laughs> The sample rate coming from the antenna is like one million gigahertz, or one million hertz, or it says one million on there, and it, it decimates down to, I think it's 48K after a while, and then, and what, what our audio is getting is 48K, a okay. 16-bit. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna show our technical details. You know, it's, that's, it's a live demo. people working on the, uh, sonal, the sun alarm or the sonar alarm project. And the basic idea behind our project is that we wanted to fix several misuse cases of people accidentally misusing their alarm clock or alarm app. So we've all had that scenario where we've uh, woken up before our alarm and we decided to go about our day, but we forgot to turn off our alarm. And the next thing you know, you're in the shower when your alarm goes off and it's a really inconvenient to have to go deal with that. 
Or another example scenario is uh, your alarm goes off and you go to turn it off, but you decide, you know, I'll lay in bed for another minute and the next thing you know, you fall back asleep. Uh, so our solution is to basically try and turn your phone into a um, mobile sonar device and use the sonar to track your motion uh, around your room. And from that, we can tell if you're actually awake and moving, and that can uh, be used to manage your alarm for you so you don't accidentally forget about it and have it go off. All right, so the basic technology behind it is we have the smartphones, which can emit tones. Uh, we generally picked a tone around 19 kilohertz, and we have a couple different microphones on the phones, uh, at least newer phones, where we can record the reflections of that tone. Uh, and based on signal processing, we can de detect small changes in the reflected tone uh, to check for motion. And based on that check, we can disable or re-enable the alarm uh, if we find the motion that we were looking for. Uh, right, so the basic idea is that if, uh, in that first uh, example I described, if you, if the uh, sonar detects that you're moving before, before your alarm uh, goes off, then it knows that, oh, you've already woken up and gone out of bed, I can disable the alarm. And in the second scenario, after the alarm goes off and you turn it off, it can check if you have actually are moving around, and if it sees that you're not really moving around, it assumes you've like fallen back asleep, so it can re-enable the alarm and have it sound and wake you up a second time. Um, so for the signal processing, uh, what we're looking for is the uh, Doppler effects of things moving in the environment. So a uh, quick recap on the Doppler effect, things that uh, emit sound or in our, our case reflect sound will uh, shift the frequency of the uh, sound recorded uh, due to the motion. So we take all of our recordings and we do several fast Fourier transforms over the data so that we can see the uh, individual frequency ranges and look at their amplitudes. And we look for the uh, reflection frequency, which is around our emitted frequency, and we can see the slight shifts in that frequency to uh, note the, the Doppler effect and uh, can tell the amount of motion that we uh, see. So we have a couple of uh, visualizations of data that we actually recorded. Uh, so this top one is an example of a wave where there was no motion. So you can see there's a peak and it comes down pretty consistently down to the bottom. And it's right around 19, well, it only says 1900, but it's uh, 19 kilohertz. And this bottom one does have motion. You can see where it kind of smudges on the base of it. So we're actually looking for the width at the base. Uh, to detect the Doppler effect so we can tell if something's in motion. And uh, we wanted to have a uh, live demo, but I can't really drag a bed down here to pretend waking up, so we have a video demo. <laughs> um, hopefully it's quiet enough. Okay, so this is a demo for the standard alarm usage where uh, I was lying in bed sleeping until the alarm goes off and it sounds normally, just to show you that our app is still capable of running with a normal alarm. So I'll just be lying here until the alarm goes off. <laughs> Fast forward to the boring part. Oh. Oh no, I need to wake up for my midterm. So this is a demo of the scenario where you uh, wake up before your alarm probably get out of bed, maybe move around your room, and eventually leave it. And the alarm should detect all that motion and know to turn itself off. So I will now pretend to get out of bed and go through my morning motions, like checking my computer, and I guess I'll grab my toothbrush and leave the room. Oh, would you look at that? The alarm I forgot to turn off. Turn itself off. So now I can be less distracted while I brush my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot to mention, so um, that was a sort of dumbed down, smaller version of the actual application that we want to develop and release. Uh, we made it uh, for the demo purposes so that we could record it easier. Um, for our actual application, we'd probably want to have the sonar run um, on regular intervals. Uh, uh, during the time leading up to the alarm and afterwards. 
But for that demo one, we just had a single interval of recording, like 30 seconds before the alarm would go off. And of course, for the ac actual application, there doesn't need to be a notification that says, I've turned off the alarm. It can just turn it off silently. But for the demo, we like added in that extra pop-up that said, hey, we've turned off the alarm. Um, and a couple of issues we ran into while developing. Uh, the range was a lot more limited than we expected. It seems to work best within about two meters or so. So detecting somebody leaving the room and or in another room uh, would be a lot more difficult. Different phone hardware became an issue because we did most of the testing on his phone, uh, which worked pretty well. My phone had different layouts of everything, so the speakers on the back, and it didn't behave quite as we expected. Like we could actually hear it, and it would emit sort of a clicking noise that we couldn't really diagnose without looking more into the hardware of my phone specifically. And then human behavior, uh, moving the phone around does have a pretty big effect on checking for motion, so that would be a way to kind of spoof it into turning itself off. Uh, and it, there's a couple different ways that we could, uh, or the app would get confused by different motions and activities. Yeah, so for most of our testing, uh, we did like uh, pretty controlled motions like of how we got out of bed, sort of like uh, you know, just sitting up and then getting out of bed. Um, but, you know, some people are really slow risers where they, like, r literally crawl out of their bed. Or maybe, you know, a person who wakes up, with, like, immediately likes to go check their phone and puts it away. And obviously, if they move it into their pocket, it's going to get really unpredictable results that we might not be able to properly, like, design heuristics to track for. Um, one other problem is that uh, the... Um, or the setup for the application definitely works best when you have your phone in an upright position, so like we showed in the demo. Um, obviously, because the sound being emitted is more directed towards where we expect motion is going to be, um, and not everyone has like a, a phone stand or dock, um, so having the phone lying down doesn't work as well, so that could be an issue that people would have. And uh, to wrap up, we'd like to give some acknowledgments. Uh, so thank you, Rajal, for helping us for uh, throughout this project. Uh, you gave us a lot of great advice on like uh, where to start off looking at sonar and uh, pointed us to a lot of useful papers for uh, the different techniques of signal processing. And uh, one paper in particular that we based a lot of our uh, signal processing on was the Soundwave paper by S. Gupta and company. Um, yeah, our, our most of our... Uh, Doppler shift uh, looking techniques were uh, based on them, even though their paper was working on laptop speakers, I believe. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is like uh, candy for me <laughs> <laughs> to sit in here and listen to this. These are uh, great ideas, and, and uh, uh, you're all just so uh, motivated and interested in what you do it. It's, it's great to see that. And it's sort of the, you know, the, the starting point, the feedstock for the types of things that we do invest in, in early stage companies. I think everyone who's part of this program um, enjoys a special gift. And I say that because I think there are a lot of people in this world that sort of see the world and accept it as it is and assume that you can't change anything. And there are another large group of people that see the world and don't accept it but they really don't have the ability to change it. They're frustrated, oftentimes angry. Uh, and I think that the folks in this room belong to a special class in the sense that you see the world, you see the opportunity to change it, and because of your training, your knowledge, your aptitude, creativity, you do have the ability to change things, and that's a special gift. Um, so I'd encourage you to kind of continue to work on that, and as you think, see things that could be made better, could be changed. Uh, just keep innovating, keep creating, keep trying. Um, not everything's going to work for sure, uh, and that's true of venture capital. You know, we, if we make uh, 100 investments, uh, we know that 80% of them probably aren't going to make it, or at least not make it to the potential that we want. So anyway, congratulations uh, on uh, the work you've been doing, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Yeah.